So my talk would be about mapping suitability for avian influenza, and we'll be talking mostly about the work we've been doing on H7 and 9 and H5 and 1. So the, the general purpose we have, and, and some of you, many of you are familiar with that, but for those who aren't, it's just a useful reminder, is that we're trying to look at different drivers that could influence the suitability for, for infections and factors, and we try to integrate those in, into those um, suitability maps in the hope that they can contribute to better prevention and surveillance. So that's the why we're doing um, all this. And a clear, um, important turning point in terms of understanding the spatial epidemiology of avian influenza has been H5N1, because it's really the reference um, ep epidemic by its geographical extent. It was introduced by in more than 60, uh, well, in 60 countries, uh, at a time where many countries in Asia were not truly prepared to face such an epidemic. It had a huge impact, there, both direct and in indirect, on the poultry sector, and there was of course, uh, a significant number of human cases. So the situation has quite changed with regard to H5N1, which still persists in a few countries in Asia, um, mostly Bangladesh, Cambodia, China, Egypt, not in Asia, but being the only country outside Asia where it persists, Indonesia and Vietnam. So the, this shows the accumulated distribution of H5N1 cases, mostly in poultry, on the top of which you have human cases. So you have a fairly heterogeneous data set that we had to work with. And over the years, we've been confronted with lots of difficulties because what you look at is changing over time. So this, for example, shows you different epidemic waves of H5N1 in Thailand, and it's, of course, influenced by how the surveillance and control is organized. And this shows you different distribution of H5N1 records in, in Indonesia where first for four years it, it was, people knew it was present, but there was only very, very, very few um, records that had, were reported. Then there was very important surveillance programs that were implemented and that have continued over the years that resulted in a very much, much more higher number of cases. And then, of course, what you have is also influenced by what you look at. So for example, in China, you could have outbreaks recorded in, mostly in poultry farms, you could have a few, number of human cases, and you could also have positive markets um, where a, a, a positive sample has been identified. Now, how we've been dealing with those different situations in our, in, in our mapping has been to, because there is such heterogeneity on this just pattern, spatial and temporal pattern of surveillance control and that it influences the outcome so strongly, We've been breaking down our analysis by country and epidemic phases and trying to compare the outcome that we have um, observed in different countries for different studies to gain a general understanding from those multiple studies. So today I'm going to focus more uh, precisely on China. And we focused our analysis on the limit set of factors. We were concentrating mostly on the uh, poultry hosts because they determine the animals that are infected, the pattern of excretion and the contact with other hosts. We focused on some anthropogenic factors because they influence how the poultry hosts are moved, and we focused on some environmental um, factors as well. So in China, we've been working, we had published in 2001 with uh, Vincent Martin from FAO, um, the first suitability map for um, outbreaks that were based on uh, poultry farm outbreaks that was highlighting a um, strong correlation with chicken and human population density that was giving strong emphasis on intensive production areas in northern China. And we also had first results of uh, the silent, indicating where the silent circulation of H5N1 was happening, in, and that was more linked to um, human population, but also duck density in the proportion of water, which we believe happened to be more the ecological niche of the underlying uh, virus circulation. Now, then came H7 and 9 uh, that emerged in China in 2013 and had that, that's been through two different epidemic waves that has been so far limited to China but where there was a very significant number of human cases. And the two um, epidemic are, are very, very different in lots of their features. Um, H5N was, was uh, highly pathogenic in chicken, was mostly found in birds, um, it was really linked to, to farm and, and to, to where the outbreaks were recorded, and it took um, a continental scale uh, spread. 
whereas H7-9 was low pathogenic in uh, chicken, mostly found in people and, and very strongly linked to market and limited to China in its geographical extent. So this forces us to, to change the unit of analysis from uh, farms or localized outbreak to, to markets. And this shows the, the, the distribution of H7 and 9 um, human cases. And this is some work we've been doing with Nick Golding and, and others um, here in collaboration with Matt and, and Simon. It shows you the, that there was a geographical spread that the disease started in the yellow dots around the Shanghai area and then spread along, uh, along the coastline with, with the latest case being in red. But if you plot this spread in the environmental space, so that's in the space defined by the conditions in which the positive record have been found, conditions in terms of poultry density, in, in terms of live bird market density, in terms of the number of different factors we're considering, it stayed in the same niche. I mean, it didn't expand its niche in the environmental domain. And this allowed us to, to map the suitability for H7 and 9 infection with some reliability and an important aspect that we had to address here is that because we were training our model based on a limited area, we had to quantify what was the geographical extrapolation capacity of our model. Because it's something that we wanted to use, because we want to extrapolate it our prediction through the rest of Asia. So we did, we implemented a procedure to evaluate this extrapolation capacity, and which was relatively good and that allowed us to generate predictions across Asia that were highlighting places where, should the virus be introduced, it would have a good chance to persist. Now, if you compare now H5N1 with H7N9, I mean, clearly, th there are differences between those two maps, but you can also see um, some common areas, um, mostly in the Shanghai area and in and behind Guangdong. And so there are some factors that appear to be, that could possibly be common between the two epidemics. And the other aspect is that if you look at the uh, suitability maps outside of China, it actually pinpoints areas where H5N1 persists now. So it's Java, it is Vietnam, it's in Bangladesh, there is very, very poor data, but we believe that the virus is still um, persisting there. So, in fact, the commonalities may go beyond um, what, what we believe, and one of the important common factors between all those areas is a very high density of live bird market, and we believe that's, what, that's one of the underlying drivers that explain the commonalities between those different regions. Now, there are other aspects, of course, because I've been talking about H5N1, H7N9, and you, we do have uh, new viruses emerging all the time. So no FAO has been issuing a, a warning about H5 and 6 that has been found in different places in Asia recently, last year, in 2014. It's highly pathogenic, and it's already been found in, Tao, in China, Laos, and Vietnam. There's H5 and 8, also highly pathogenic, that's been found in China and Korea. And this brings me to the question of how can we now move from tracking with the disease where it spread, which is a bit like tracking ambulances, toward um, trying to find what are the area where it emerged to, so that we can do better prevention. So I'd like to show you this uh, initial risk map and to point on it some important human cases of different um, in, even influenza subtype that have been identified there. So of course, H5N1, what was first sample uh, in Guangdong in 1996. H7 and 9, of course, we've been talking about this one, but there was also this H10 N9 that was found in human in the city of Nanchang, and H5 and 6 that just, just found a few, a few months ago. So we can simply, for example, zoom into this area, into Nanchang, and I'd like to make you visit this area, which is Poyang Lake, which is one of the most important freshwater lake of China that is host to the most abundant wild bird population. And in um, in dark green here, I don't know if there's a pointer, but you can see the dark green in this area. This is natural wetland um, where that is host to all of those very, very high wild bird population. And in pale green in this area here, it is full of rice fields and um, poultry farming. So the area itself is host to half a million wild birds that are in the 
in the wild bird habitat in, in, the, in the wetlands. Three million wild bird that have been farmed, which is a new business that emerged over the last 10 years, by which farmers do pick eggs and make a new uh, farm to, to have those wild birds. And you, it's surrounded by 10 countries with 26 million ducks and geese in farms, which is about the size of duck population in Thailand. 21 million domestic chicken in farms and 6 million people. So if you're talking about an interface, that's probably the most larger interface you can imagine between the wild and domestic avifauna in the world. In this area, so you could, if you, when you visit it, you can, you, you can see those ducks uh, free-ranging in rice paddy fields, so that's in the rice area, and you can also see some of those ducks farms that are right on the edge of the lake, where you can see that biosecurity is not to the same standard that we can think of in other countries. What you cannot see on this picture is that on the back of it, under the tree, there was a whole group of wild geese that were resting there. So you can imagine the extent of the interface you have in such area. Now back to the, this is back to the emergence of H7 and 9. You can simply look at the city of Huzu, where there was several H7 and 9 cases that were confirmed and where some of the highest infection rates of, were found in the, in the market. So Huzu is, I don't know if I have a pointer, it's over here. You can simply use Google Earth and zoom in, and if you activate the image, you can see lots of different images of the area. And one attracted my attention because it's a rice paddy field, and in the back of the rice paddy field, you can see those ducks. So you find those type of ecosystem <coughs> that are wetland-related agriculture with rice and livestock in those, in those regions of emergence. So if we, you can map this more systematically, um, and here we have a map of human population in this area where there was, um, that are important for emergence. So you have Nanshang here, you have Shanghai, Huzu, and Hangzhou. And you can, oh, sorry, you can see it's an important area for rice and water. So really, you have this combination of urbanized area where you have the highest density of life in the market, surrounded by landscape, kitchen water, ice paddy fields and local populations. And we believe this is a very, very strong um, interface in area for emergence that would deserve better uh, targeted surveillance. And all those points, of course, are connected through increased mobility through live bird market networks. This is the work we did with Vincent Martin from FAO, who had been making surveys where, where by which the birds are transported over very long distances, and we come back to the question of mobility that Simon was, was writing earlier before, but within, within countries you have very, very extensive movement between special units. And of course, for some of those viruses, and it's a bit unclear uh, for which virus is important or not, there is also the wild bird movement themselves that can link a point like Poreng Lake that I just illustrated here to very, very distant places in Korea or further in the north. And so, and the last factors, of course, is that this is not uh, slowing down, and it links to the talk that Tim was giving uh, earlier on, because we have here the plot that shows you um, the, the rise of duck production in China alone compared to the um, duck production in red in Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, Vietnam, and Indonesia. And even though you can see that there was the epidemics of H5N1 mostly here, I mean, even since there was still a massive increase in the production of, of ducks. So just to, to, to wrap up on those different aspects, in terms of progresses, I think that from the time when H5N1 first started, there's been really, really improvement in terms of the awareness, especially in Asia and equipment of at-risk countries. And I believe we have a much better spatial understanding of the factors that are favoring um, the, 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 the persistence. We understand better the factors that influence the emergence, which is that we don't have really yet translated this into empirical evidences. Um, and those factors are uh, believed to be wetland agriculture at the interface with wild waterfalls and together with intensification of poultry production for chicken and ducks at this interface. And the ones that are mostly influencing the spread aspect are live bird market networks and trade with an increased mobility and increased flows. And wise bird could equally be important, have been 
shown to be in port 485 and 1, but there is still a big question mark regarding their role for other uh, subtypes. Now, what can be done? Of course, I mean, the live bird market seems to be a key um, in terms of uh, protecting people from exposure and uh, preventing the spread. So improving the management of live bird market seems the, as probably the in the short term, the best option who are better cleaning the function rest days and registering of, of those markets and of the people who go there. And another action that FIO is thinking of is, is to try to reduce long distance poultry trade through a, a better management of prices because one of the strongest drivers, of course, of flows between different units is prices and balances that is driving the, the, the flow you could have um, across borders, especially and even um, between borders between countries. And of course, uh, possibly enhance the security and management of poultry farms that are located on those uh, specific interfaces.